<clears throat> well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk about uh, Suricata. It's great to be back here after three, year, three years. Back in 2008, when we just uh, had just received our funding, uh, we Matt Youngman and I were here to uh, announce our plans and uh, solic solicit for ideas. And uh, so three years later, and uh, it seemed like a good moment to come back and tell you about what we're doing now and where we are. Um, those of you that attended Aaron Finnan's talk yesterday, uh, <clears throat> they might have heard a pretty pessimistic story about how IDS is doing uh, and, uh, it, and about especially its detection accuracy. Uh, I'm not quite as pessimistic, although there are definitely some issues, uh, but uh, there is, has been a lot of progress. Um, This talk is uh, from Eric LeBlanc here and myself, Victor Julian. Uh, let me quickly introduce Eric. Eric is a security and open source professional since the end of the 20th century. He has created and has been the lead of the NU Firewall, um, an enterprise, uh, a project aimed at creating an, an identity-based enterprise firewall. Eric is a long-term con contributor to, of NetFilter uh, the packet filtering framework for Linux. Uh, and uh, among other things, he has made major contributions to ULOG2, the user space logging daemon. He's a frequent speaker in French free software and security conferences and also writes articles in the specialized press like uh, Linux Magazine France. Uh, he has, for example, been the main author of the net specific special net filter issue. He was also the co founder of. INL Edenwall company where he was a CTO to build enterprise grade network appliances based on NU firewall. Um, Eric is now a freelance security consultant uh, in free and security software and he works currently for OISF among, among other things and for OISF he is the maintainer of the packet acquisition system and our inline and IPS support. A little bit about myself. I'm the lead developer of Siricata. Uh, some people may know my other project, which is Fumur. It's a firewall front end for, uh, for, uh, for IP tables. Uh, but most people pronounce it as Fumur, which is uh, the, mostly the English speaking people. I've worked with Snort Inline for years as a developer and uh, also uh, as a contractor. I've done lots, lots of work on Snort. Um, in late 2007, about four years ago, I started working on a little multi-threaded packet forwarding uh, program and uh, it got a little out of control and here we are. So the next 40 to 45 minutes we'll be talking about Suricata. Um, well, I will sell, tell you quickly about what Suricata is. Uh, who builds it, why we build it, um, how it works, what makes it great. Uh, I'll be highlighting some major features. After that, Eric will, um, will be showing some recent advances in Suricata uh, in how it deals with SSL and TLS traffic. Um, there's a lot of things going on in this area, especially uh, I'm from the Netherlands and uh, as a Dutch guy, I don't like being uh, reminded of DigiNotar the uh, uh, certificate authority that was hacked, and uh, Eric will show some things that we can uh, help there, can do there. Um, SSL is de definitely a topic that's hard for an IDS in general, but we can do some interesting things there. So after Eric is done with that, uh, I will be returning uh, to the stage and uh, tell you about file extraction one of the new features we're working on uh, in Suricata. So what is Suricata? Suricata is a network intrusion detection and prevention system, or really engine. It's really an engine, um, but people are so used to saying system that uh, uh, we, we kind of just keep using that as well, but really Suricata on its own is, is only of limited use. You're supposed to use it in a much larger ecosystem of tools to 
do complete detection in your network. Circad is open source with most of its code, uh, GPL v2, and some parts uh, under a BSD license. Circada works by looking at network traffic. <coughs> it inspects each packet. Um, it, uh, it's against known bad, uh, which means we use signatures heavily. In addition to this, we, we detect all kinds of anomalies during parsing and decoding of the traffic, and um, uh, so we can detect that as well. Circada uses the Snort signature language, um, so existing rules are generally supported but I'll go into more, more details later. Suricata is built by us here, but also by a whole lot of other people. It's, the development is organized around the Open Information Security Foundation, which is a US-based nonprofit, and it's funded by uh, the US Department of Homeland Security, uh, also known as DHS. They've pretty much stalled us with the funding to do something good with it, with no specific deliverables. Uh, so Suricata is what we were doing. Um, using this funding, we've been able to uh, pay developers uh, to work on it. And also, we have spent some of our funding on other uh, development, like uh, we've uh, we've developed, or, or we have asked Ivan Ristich, who you know, might know from Mod Security, to write a specific security-aware HTTP li uh, parsing library. Um, another example of, of using this funding to uh, support other projects is uh, we had did some funding of the Barnyard 2 tool, which include uh, uh, for work to include the SnortSAM tool, which and SnortSAM is a tool to uh, send block commands to your firewall based on snort rules or uh, suricata rules. Uh, so we have funding, but uh, for the longer term, we're uh, looking at vendors to uh, support the project. And uh, we formed a consortium where companies that have an interest or a stake in suricata can, uh, can support us. And usually they support it by cash or they support it using uh, or um, having us access, giving us access to some of their developers to uh, help us build things. And this is a slide with some of, some of the companies that are uh, helping us currently. Um, um, so how does, how does Suricata work as an IDS? Well, the first thing is we uh, process packets. So we need to be able to see packets. So a network IDS you usually place in a network uh, and in a switch network that's a, it's, it's always a challenge to get, get packets to the IDS. So you usually uh, you, you control your, uh, your configure your switches to use some kind of span port and send all the traffic to your IDS. So once you'd, you've done that the IDS sees the packet and it needs to try to understand them. So for this it <clears throat> starts decoding them. Uh, it takes a, the packet apart. It, it parses the IP header or Ethernet headers, IP headers, TCP headers. And at some point, when this is all done, uh, Suricata will know all about the packet. Some packets are fragmented, uh, like Aaron also uh, showed in his uh, uh, talk yesterday, um, but we have a defragmentation engine, so uh, that's taken care of. Um, for TCP packets, after the decoding stage, we will start reconstructing uh, TCP sessions, reassembling uh, the, uh, the data layer, and uh, find all kinds of anomalies like retransmissions uh, with different data and, and all kinds of other things. So at the end of this stage, we have a reassembled stream that is, can be inspected. Um, but we do more with reassembled stream. We go to, um, we have a, an, an advanced HTTP parser and, and a few other parses like the TLS parser Eric will be speaking about. And uh, what we do based on the uh, reassembled data is reconstruct the full HTTP session. Um, 
this is done in a stateful way, so every new, new data just updates the state and we keep a state of the entire HTTP session. So if that's all complete, then we're ready to do detection. And in the detection stage, both or all the packet, the stream, and the state are inspected against the rules. And the rules here are the, the signatures, as you may know them from, from Snort, but also uh, all, our, um, all the anomalies we detect during parsing and decoding uh, are exposed to the rule language, so you can uh, uh, have rules that do specific matching of, uh, on these anomalies. So in the detection, uh, uh, so if the detection finds uh, alerts or um, find rules that match, alerts go to the output stage, which is the final stage. Um, here an alert is processed by various output plugins. The most simple one is, is uh, a, a snort-like fast log, uh, but we also support Prelude and uh, Unified 2 to support all kinds of other tools that uh, are available. Okay. So we can also work as an IPS. Um, the big difference there is that instead of just detection, we can do prevention. Uh, the IPS mode is supposed to be in line, so you, uh, the, the IPS gets in between the various hosts. And um, in general, it will pretty much work the same way uh, internally as the IDS. However, we do some um, other things like normalization of especially HTTP streams. There is a lot of anomalies uh, and evasion possibilities like Aaron uh, discussed yesterday, which are uh, we, we can remove from the stream. So that's then we really uh, alter the packets on the network. Um, of course, the rules can be uh, set to uh, drop, based, uh, drop packets and streams based on uh, uh, the, the matches in the rules. So their IDS has a lot of limitations. Um, it's a, it has even, oh, sorry. It has even be, been declared dead by Gartner and the researchers. Um, but we feel it's far from that. There are some issues like Aaron uh, discussed yesterday. The first problem we have with IDS is that it's fairly easy to overwhelm it. Uh, usually an IDS is, is sitting on a, a, a span port in a switch, and usually, the, or in many occasions, this span port is, does not have the full capacity to um, uh, get all the packets on a fully loaded switch to the IDS. So, uh, there's the first problem of, of packet loss. Another reason IDS is fairly easy to overwhelm is because IDS operations are quite uh, CPU intensive uh, and expensive. Uh, and IDS has to keep an internal representation of about dozens or hundreds or even thousands of hosts and their network activity. So if you, for example, take a 10, 10 gigabit network, you could be talk, talking about about 15 million packets a second that needs to be that need to be compared and parsed, and uh, and you would inspect them, for example, against 10,000 or 15,000 rules. So it's quite easy to see that that just the number these numbers will lead you to very heavy hardware requirements, and not everyone has it. So packet loss is always a problem. A different problem is what we call impedance mismatch. This is uh, this issue also is also um, got some attention under the name of AETs or advanced evasion techniques. So what it means is, and it's in part the same thing that Aaron was discussing yesterday, is that there is ambiguities in the network traffic and in the way OSs and programs are handling these ambiguities. And um, the IDS has to make a choice, like how, with what, what way to um, uh, interpret traffic. So, for example, uh, Aaron discussed differences by, between, between Apache and IAS web servers, or even Apache and, on Windows and Apache on Unix. Uh, but differences like this exist on every layer we're looking at and usually get worse the higher you get. And I have an example here. 
desk. This is a table I took from uh, Ryan Barnett's Tactical Web Application Security blog. And it shows what the IDS, IPS, or WAF has to deal with. Um, Ryan investigated a <laughs> simple question. How does the web application respond if it receives multiple parameters, HTTP parameters with the same name but different values? And if, as you can see, the, uh, the result is quite dis dissatisfying. Uh, this is just a, one list of, of frameworks, web application frameworks, and many, many have all kinds of different ways of interpreting this. And this is what we're seeing all over the place. It's just uh, quite a mess. False positives are an obvious problem in IDS. Uh, we've had problems with, in part, or due to poor rules uh, or the engines not being able to expose enough uh, specific, specific enough buffers. Uh, an, an example of a buffer here would be a URI or a, a HTTP method or something like that. So if you, if you try to match on something that's not specifically uh, exposed by the IDS engine, you will have to be uh, creative in the rules and often this leads to false positives. False neg negatives are obviously a, an even bigger problem. They can, again, come from bad rules. They can come from engine bugs that do poor or uh, normalization, missing decoding. Um, and of course, packet loss is a major issue for uh, false negatives and other resource starvation issues where you would overwhelm the IDS so it cannot inspect everything is a big issue. So the last thing I want to mention about the limitations is uh, encryption. Of, obviously, encryption is hard for an IDS because usually you cannot decrypt the packets or the sessions. And with HTTPS and uh, SSH traffic, for example, that's uh, a big problem. There are some um, SSL decryptor options, but um, Suricata at least doesn't do support that directly. So what does Suricata do to deal with this, or also known as major features? Um, well, the first thing is that Suricata will really help you to get the most out of your hardware. So we are using multi-threading. Uh, we're supporting out-of-the-box uh, hardware capture cards, and we're experimenting with GPU acceleration. The second thing is Circado uses automatic, automatic protocol detection for higher level protocols so, such as HTTPS, and I'll go more into these uh, after this slide. We support large IP blacklists. Uh, there's a lot of information out there in, on the internet on IP addresses, and the IDS is, a, is an interesting place to, to use it. And we have uh, very thorough HTTP inspection and logging, and HTTP is obviously one of the more important protocols. So multi-threading. One of the core ideas was to Suricata was to make it multi-threaded. Uh, the reason is probably pretty obvious. Even your smartphone nowadays it usually has a dual core. Your next tablet might have a quad core. Uh, a, a server with two quad core boxes and hyper-threading which leads to 16 logical CPUs uh, are already quite cheap. Uh, Intel has a 10-core Xeon with, with hyper-threading enabled. It's 20 threads. AMD just announced a 16-core Opteron. And Tylera, which not everyone might know, has a, uh, CPUs with 64 and 100 cores. So using that is, is uh, or trying to really exploit those hard, uh, hardware features is high on our list. So Suricata has a highly modular threading design, which allows us to uh, experiment a lot with all kinds of threading configurations. From a completely single threaded uh, model, where we just run one single thread, to many hundreds of threads. Uh, there is a paper in which people, uh, people tested Suricata, and they somehow managed to get it, their hands on a box with 576 cores in it. And it worked with Suricata, it just used them all. It, sadly, they didn't really investigate the scaling, they just compared it to Snort, uh, which was an unfair comparison because they just ran one Snort and one core. But uh, it was cool to, just to see that it actually worked. So far, 
uh, from our experiments, it appears that flow-based load balancing between threads is performing the best. And we can do this with a single packet input, so, such as um, uh, libpcap, um, which then distributes it over all the other threads for, for the processing, or we can use, uh, for example, PF ring, a packet ex acquisition method can ex uh, expose multiple readers. Um, so we can have load balancing in the kernel instead of uh, in user space. The next version we're expecting to have the same kind of support for end days network cards and uh, Napa tech cards. Uh, talking about um, capture cards, end days and Napa tech are, are the two were and this is already working. Napatech is what we're working on currently to get integrated. Uh, these are usually very expensive cards. Uh, I think they start at something like 10 to 20,000 euros or dollar, I'm not sure. Um, but they are really required if you want high speed packet capture. And in general, what they do is they have huge buffers to, uh, to minimize packet loss and all kinds of things. So not everyone has the deep pockets for those cards. So PF ring is a, is a poor man's equivalent. Uh, it works on all kinds of hardware, but has special support for certain types of uh, network cards. GPU acceleration. Um, like I mentioned, we're experimenting with this uh, it's, and we're currently using the CUDA framework for it. Uh, the potential of the GPU is very appealing. It's very, very fast in if you uh, manage to get it uh, operated right. Uh, but it turns out to be a lot harder than we anticipated uh, and hoped. So we have an implementation and it does work. However, it is slower than our CPU implementation, which kind of defeats its purpose. So we're actually in touch with NVIDIA uh, to try and improve things. And um, OpenCL is, uh, is, is one of the things we want to be looking at. OpenCL is the, the platform independent CUDA-like uh, um, API. It, it is supported by AMD, for example, as well with their ATI cards. And uh, Intel even has some support for it. And just yesterday, Intel announced some, still a little bit vague, but they installed uh, and on some GPU-like hardware that's supposed to be like uh, like the um, GPU, uh, the, the CUDA, um, it's, it's supposed to be working like like o with OpenCL or CUDA, I think, and it's it has like 50 cores or more, and but it's still a little bit vague. But there is a lot of movement in this area where you would offload certain tar types of um, operations to specific hardware. Uh, but programming is, it is quite hard. So one of the features I mentioned was high level protocol detection. And this has been especially helpful in detecting malware. The idea is that we have special code that um, allows us to detect a protocol on uh, independent of ports. And for example, previously you would have a rule in Snort uh, that would probably look something like this. You would, uh, if you would be looking at HTTP traffic. So HTTP, <coughs> HTTP ports, the variable here that controls which, on which port we would be looking is usually set to something like 80, 81, and a few others. But if you would be out of luck if, if the malware or whatever you're matching against is on a different port. So what we're, uh, we have extended the language to be able to say alert on HTTP, which means we'll be relying on our uh, protocol detection, and then the detection can be on any port. This has, ac this has actually helped, especially malware detection, enormously because a lot of malware uses um, HTTP traffic for command and control, and they often use off ports, so the non-standard ports. 
and we are seeing much, much better detection rates because of this. High-speed IP matching is one of the things I mentioned. Um, if you know the Emerging Threats Project, they have enormous lists of known bad IP addresses, compromised, uh, suspected Russian business network, all kinds of things. And previously, you could you had to choose between a few of the those um, uh, rule sets to be really uh, using them in in a performance efficient way. So we have created a special module in our code to just be able to load them all and uh, uh, get alerted or uh, drop even uh, the hosts if, if one of your hosts is contact, uh, contacting such a uh, blacklisted host. Is this also supported by the other accelerator cards? Or? No, this is all in software, yes. Um, so, I, like I already mentioned, our HTTP parsing is um, done with libhttp, the library written by Ivan Ristich, who is uh, the author of Mod Security and currently working on IronB, another WAF and a web, web application firewall. So, because HTTP is so important, we figured we get help from someone that really, really knows what he's doing in HTTP. So, this is the library he wrote for us. It uh, constructs a full state uh, of the HTTP session that we constantly update. It can track all transactions um, and it allows us to do, for example, file extraction, but I'll get into that later. Um, LibHTTP is available outside of Suricata. It's a GPL licensed library in the older versions and newer versions are even Apache licensed, so it's even more liberal to integrate into any tool you want. And one of the things we do with it is a simple request logger that, um, for example, should be an example here. Yeah. So the, this is uh, on a single line normally. It's a simple log that's kind of resembling the information uh, an Apache access log, for example, has. And it just shows that for everything. Um, it's quite useful to see what's going on in your network. Eric's next. <laughs> Hello, I'm here to present you the TLS support in Suricata. Uh, TLS, as mentioned by uh, Victor, is uh, an application layer which is supported by Suricata. And an application layer has two interesting features. This is independent of port because we have automatic detection. Auton it uses pattern matching to find the protocol and thus we, can not, we do not rely on poor. And it uses a dedicated keyword that we can use to match some specific part of uh, the packet. For example, in HTTP, we've got uh, a keyword to match the URI or to match the cookies. And this is the same for TLS support, which, which has also some keywords. And this, these keywords are, can be used in signatures. Uh, the Suricata application layer is composed of multiple protocols, as you can see on the slide. Uh, what is the TLS uh, support in Suricata? This is a TLS on-check parcel. We did not decrypt the traffic. We just analyzed the on-check by getting every packet and checking uh, every message and decoding every message to be able to know which certificates are exchanged, which parameters, algorithm are used, to do an SSTLS negotiation. Um, we, we decide to, to do uh, our own security oriented parser for this TLS on check. The point was not to use OpenSSL directly. OpenSSL is very big and we want to be able to audit the code and to test it, to be able to hack it and to be able to, for example, to to have some event related to anomaly detection. And for that, we need to have our own code. Um, thus, the code has been developed from scratch by Pierre Chiflier, which is working from INSSC, which is the Frank Network and Security Agency. Um, and 
AWP with security in mind that it, that has made some audit with some other colleague. I made some audit too, and has first the code to be able to sh to to valid date that you will uh, resist to attack of anything like that. But what can we do with uh, with this uh, TLS support? First thing is the same thing that uh, Victor showed you on HTTP. You can just say alert on TLS instead of saying alert on TCP, which will give you some very advantages because you're not dependent anymore of uh, the IP parameters. You don't specify any port, any the TCP port, for example. And that's why you, you just can have more flow study by the web parser, unless you can detect anomaly, for example, if you have a control and command channel which is done on some unusual port on using TLS, you can detect it on, for example, detect some generic certificate that, that are used uh, that you want to block. And one of the advantages of uh, using this application layer is that you limit the match to the correct protocol. You don't try to to do some pattern matching or some binary stream. If it's not TLS, you could have a match, for example, if you have a match on something like uh, 5A, like we have in the previous uh, talk about IDS version, uh, you will easily match. But if you check this, for example, on some TLS protocol, having 5A will be very strange. And by doing this, we just run the signatures on the good protocol, which means that you will not try to analyze the traffic on uh, none, uh, on all packets, but just on packets with the correct protocol. Doing this, you limit the number of packets analyzed with uh, signatures, and thus you increase the performance of IDS. And as you know, uh, the performance of IDS is really important. Uh, what are the current keywords supported by TLS? We've got TLS version, which match the TLS version of, uh, used in the check. We've got the subject, which, do, which is doing a string match on the certificate subject. And we've got TLS issuer DN, which, uh, done a, which done a string match on the certificate issuer DN. We've got more to come. This is currently work in progress. And we will describe the evolution. I will describe the evolution later. Uh, what, what, what can we do with that? For example, let's have a classical uh, settings with a company running some servers and having its own official PKI. If it has its own official PKI, every certificate from on all servers have to be signed with this PKI. If we don't have that. We have something wrong that has been deployed on the network. This is our administrator that has not put the correct certificate. We should have an alert on this. Or worse, this is a hacker who has put some service, uh, some, um, some service that, that should be stopped. And to do so, it's really easy. We just, we just do an alert with a product TLS protocol. We do this for any flow in direction to all servers with dollar servers variable. And the match is done on if the issuer of end of a, of a negotiated certificate is not the one we know. That's it, that's, that's mean. The certificate that is used for the TLS on check is not something that has been made by our own certificate authority. This is simple to write. You just have to know your certificate authority and you've got summary security features that is provided by this system. There is other example uh, that can be provided. This one is one of the main motivation behind doing the SSL on TLS support is to detect the mismatch between the certificate provided and the certificate authority who has made the certificate. For example, it is well known that Google.com is signed by Google Internet Authority. It is not signed by DigiNota. Sorry for the Dutch. <laughs> and if we detect this, this is really, really bad. Thus, we can, in EPS mode, for example, make um, a signature, which is drop, not alert. Drop will drop the packet. And if any of our clients connect 
to something that is in the subject google.com, but which is in fact not signed, see the uh, exclamation mark before TLS is word end, which is not signed by Google Certificate Authority, then in this case, we drop the packet, we block the connection. But that means you will not be, you will be able to check that your certificates, that your client inside your network will not connect outside to a rogue server serving invalid google.com certificate traditionally used for phishing or things like that. But uh, I've heard, sorry for the Dutch again, uh, that campaign has been hacked too, another certificate authority has been hacked, and thus for, for, for that we can, as we are doing some string matching, we can do it more violently and say, okay, if there is your DN, is something coming from the Netherlands, I want to drop the packet. Okay, I don't recommend this in production, but could be bad, I think there is some certificate authority left. Uh, okay, uh, with, uh, there is some current limitation on, the, on this TLS support. For example, we just ma do the match, we just, we just are doing the match on the first certificate. We do not, um, we are not able to do the match on the world certificate chain because you know, we've got, uh, so we can have some certificate authority that is a sub-certificate authority. But this is already passed by the, uh, by the backend. What is just missing is the, uh, is the keywords and the syntax for the signatures, the, thus you, which you should have this very soon available. Uh, the same thing is, is, is true for the, some keywords that are still missing. For example, we can check uh, the cryptographic algorithm which is used to, to do the TLS, to, to use in, the, in TLS, and that, that, is, that can be really useful. For example, you've got the Tor attack by Eric Fiol, which has been discussed uh, lately, and it, uh, it was uh, working by, by downgrading the protocol on some Windows OS by using a virus. And by, with, by doing this, we, can, we, we could check that the protocol are not being downgraded from what we want, what we expect as security level in the protocol used. And we can do the same with case size, which is related to the security uh, and quality of, um, uh, um, of the cryptography and the defilement parameters. And last, last point in uh, SSL support is do some statistical study. For example, being able to have a hash of certificate that we will detect when it changes. For example, it, it will permit us not to uh, depend on explicit rules like google.com is signed by google.com certificate authority. I give a speech back to Julian. Ten minutes? Okay. Um, file extraction uh, is what we're currently working on. Um, it, <clears throat> in my opinion, a very exciting feature, uh, although we have limited to HTTP currently and we're working on SMTP as well. The idea is pretty simple. Uh, we track the, TC, uh, the HTTP sessions in a very detailed way, so if it, there is a file download or upload, uh, we pretty much know exactly where it is in the stream. So why not extract it? Um, we can extract it from get request, for example, but also from post request and uh, put request. Um, let me skip a little bit here. So what we can do is um, just pretty much drop the files into a directory uh, and we put in a little meta file which has some more information about it. Uh, I will show that later. Um, but dropping it uh, into a directory will enable you to uh, have third party tools like an antivirus or you could check uh, MD5 checksum, or you could, could check, uh, you could send it to some SandNet or something and run the malware if it's an executable. Uh, so it will allow you to easily do more detection than um, uh, you would do with just looking at the network traffic itself. Um, but we didn't, we didn't stop there, we really only started because uh, the interesting thing for me at least is where 
magic comes in. And magic is not real magic, of course, but it's, uh, we use lip magic to uh, determine file types. And lip magic, you might all know it, or you might not know that you know, it's what powers the file command in, in Unix or Linux. Uh, it, it is the command that you can use to determine almost any file type uh, and see what it is. Um, to, um, to really get to the power of this, you need, we needed to do uh, rule extensions, rule language extensions, and that's what I'll discuss next. A little bit about Suricata rule language. It's a subset and superset of the Snort language. Uh, we left out all kinds of things nobody uses, no rule set actually uses. And we added some new things like the TLS work and um, like the uh, file extraction things I will be talking about. Well, this is a very simple Snort rule. Uh, there has, has been a few uh, uh, in Eric's examples already, so I'll skip that part. So the rule extensions for file magic, for file extraction. Uh, the first one is file magic. And what it does, it sends uh, the file, or the file is, is uh, interpreted with libmagic, and libmagic will tell us in a string what the type of file is. And for example, it will tell us that a file is an executable for MS Windows. And you could create a rule like this that says, I want to, want to see an alert if we see a Windows download. Um, then the next option is the file store command, uh, for, uh, file store keyword. And it will do nothing for detection. It will only say if the rule actually matches, store the file to disk, and we can inspect it further there uh, outside of Suricata. The third rule keyword is the file X uh, keyword. And it's very simple, it just matches on uh, the extension that is claimed uh, in the request. So you download a file or you upload a file, you give a file name there. Um, it might not match the actual file type. And this is what you can see here in the rule. We, we match on a file that has a G, JPG uh, extension, so we expect a JPEG file, but in the file magic, you see with the exclamation mark that the rule matches if it's not actually a J JPG file. And uh, this has very useful uh, uh, use cases, I think. Finally, we also added file name, which is just simple to f a simple file name match. So if you have some kind of naming scheme where uh, uh, everything that is secret has secrets in, it, in its name, then you could match on it here. So a real example, say you have a web server and you only accept PDF uploads to it and your user interface makes sure that normal users will not be sending in PDFs. So if, if you would see an, a file that's not a PDF that's being uploaded, someone is bypassing your user interface and trying something funny. Well, here you can see uh, a, a more detailed rule on how we would prevent or alert on that. So we have a rule that is on HTTP, it comes in from the outside world to our web server. Uh, it is to the server, a post, re post request in HTTP, it's to upload.php, and then if the file is not a PDF document, we alert and we store the file for ins further inspection. As an extra check, I also, created the same rule, but then not on the file type, but on the file extension. So if the file extension is not PDF, then something is going on as well. Um, another example. I think you would want to know if your private keys are being uploaded or downloaded somewhere by accident. So this will match on an RSA private key. You could even leave out the RSA part and it will match on any type of private key. If you would have one. Um, you could also, of course, store this file, and if it's not yours, uh, you now have it, which can be used for interesting things, but that's, uh, that's for you to decide. So one final example here. Um, my girlfriend, she is a, a photographer and an artist, photo, photography artist, 
And, for, and she has a Canon camera and she uses the raw format for app optimal quality of the files. But she, will never, she never wants to send those to anyone. She wants to print, she sends another file type, or if she has a modification of her files in Photoshop, she will never want to send her, anyone a Photoshop file, but a simpler file because in pho photography, the number of prints that are publicly available really determines the price level of your photos. So it's, it's really your secret, secret source files, kind of. So this would be two rules that would drop any outgoing um, upload for Canon raw files or for Photoshop images. And I'm still trying to convince her to use GIMP and if GIMP, for GIMP you would have a similar rule. So the file is stored to disk. It's just dumped in a simple directory uh, with a meta file. The meta file looks pretty much like this. You have a timestamp, uh, source IPs, etc., and the file name as it was claimed in the request and the magic which is in this case an executable for Windows uh, and the file size is also interesting. Uh, we have some limitations currently. It's a work in progress code. I, I meant to have it committed to the publicly available Git tree but um, just failed to do that. So it should be out there probably next week. Uh, limitations obviously, protocols only HTTP now and later SMTP. We have no plans for other protocols yet. Storage limits, um, currently I, I ran a large test and I had 200,000 files on my disk which is kind of too much even if you wanted to delete them. And Microsoft is making things hard for us because most files have uh, the, their magic on the start of the file where you can determine what the file is but Microsoft Office files, you can re recognize them at the start of the file but whether or not it's a Word or an Excel or whatever file is on the end of the file which makes inspecting this very hard. Um, wrapping up, our development cycle is about two monthly. Um, we just had a release last week. Our next one will be probably in January. Uh, our, the development priorities are determined on public brainstorm sessions where everyone can come and have their say. The last one was at RAID in September and before that in RSA San Francisco. We have a public roadmap, bug tracker, et cetera, to, so you can see what we're working on. If you're interested, you can, you, I advise you to use the source, but you can also use Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, although the versions are slightly outdated. Or you can use a more specific security union or smooth tech uh, distribution. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.